ET 911 Respond. Written by Joy McNeil. Unit 627, stand down. You are not required, came the call on the radio. John slammed his hand down hard on the steering wheel as he eased his foot off the accelerator. This is the third time we have been stood down this week. When someone dials 911, why damn bother ringing us if they don't need an ambulance? Sending us all this way out into the Arizona desert for nothing. I hope they're friggin' happy. Easy there, John O., Drew replied as he leaned forward to switch off the lights and siren. It's almost the end of our shift anyway, and I, for one, am looking forward to a decent night's sleep. Just then, as John turned the ambulance around to head back to base, there shot forth a light from the sky, and something hit the ground with a bright flash in the desert not far from their vehicle. What the hell was that? John exclaimed in an excited voice. I have no idea. Could it have been a jet? We are not near any Air Force bases, though. It certainly crashed with a decent amount of speed behind it. I'll call it in, and I suggest we go check out the scene with caution. Drew was a seasoned paramedic. At 33, he had seen a lot of things in his time on the road. However, this occurrence was something very much out of the ordinary. He didn't want his young EMT partner rushing into a situation which might turn out to be a major event. The night air became misty as smoke drifted towards them from the area that the craft had gone down as smoke drifted towards them from the area the craft had gone down. The smell that emitted from this smoke was very unusual. Not the toxic odor of aviation fuel that usually accompanies a plane crash. Drew and John walked forward slowly through the tussock grass and rocks. They had to watch out for snakes and anything else that was lurking in the desert, which had the potential to cause them harm. Finally, they drew close enough to see what had fallen from the sky with such force. It was not a jet, nor any other form of human flying transportation. The smooth, silver metal of the crashed object was definitely not man-made. Shit, let's get out of here, John said, looking startled at what lay ahead of them. Drew didn't answer his partner. For once, common sense and all that he had learned in his job seemed to fade into the distance, because the sight of the spaceship intrigued him. He had always been a fan of anything sci-fi, but he had never dreamed he would come across a UFO for real. Drew took a step forward, and John reluctantly followed, not wanting to leave his partner alone in the desert with this weird object. From a distance, they moved around the circumference of the crash site. It was there, by the light of the moon, in the smoky haze of the downed UFO, that they first saw three life forms who were definitely not human. They were pale gray in color, with no hair and large heads in comparison to their tall, thin bodies. Two lay motionless on the ground, and the third, who was much smaller in size than the others, was crouched over them. By the manner in which this alien was acting, it looked as though the other two were dead. "'Come on, Drew. We need to get out of here and call the authorities,' John whispered under his breath. He had already seen more than enough, and he just wanted to get away from the area as fast as they could escape." Not yet, Jono. That creature is in pain. Look at the way she's holding herself, Drew whispered back. He was in awe of what they were witnessing. How do you know it's a female, or even that it's hurt? John asked in a surprised voice. Haven't they taught you anything in your EMS training? Just by sheer observation, it looks as though the living creature is a child, and the deceased are her parents. Take a look at them closely. The larger of the two dead aliens has lots of markings on its forehead, whereas the two smaller creatures both have the same appearance. I know she is injured by the way in which she is supporting her lower arm. I think she may have fractured it in the crash. Great observation, Dr. Watson. Now let's get out of here before the living alien decides to neutralize us with a ray gun. Jeez, Jono, you've been watching too many sci-fi movies. I can't see any form of weapon on them. All I see is one scared and hurt little alien, Drew said, picking up his orange jump bag. You can't be serious, Drew. You're not going to go over there and try to treat that thing, are you? Leave it to the authorities. Let's get out of here and call in what we have seen, John replied in a shaky voice. Yeah, I can just see the look on the dispatcher's face when we tell them about the crashed spaceship. I think it is best to let the other emergency services responding see for themselves what's up when they get here. 
In the meantime, I'm not going to sit back and wait while this creature is in obvious distress. Drew walked forward cautiously. At first he was undetected by the creature, but as he got closer, she suddenly put her head up and looked him directly in the eyes with a startled expression on her face. The medic stopped dead in his tracks, wondering now if he had made the right decision to approach the alien. However, as the creature stared up at him, with green tears running down her pale gray face, she began backing away cautiously from him. He realized that she was more scared of him than he was of her. "'It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you. My name is Drew,' he said in a calm, gentle voice as he advanced forward again. "'I don't know if you can understand me, but I mean you no harm. I want to help you.' She stopped moving away and stood looking at him with an odd expression upon her face. "'Why would you want to help me?' came a voice in the back of Drew's head. The alien was talking to him telepathically, and as she spoke to him softly, he felt a tingling sensation at the back of his neck. "'I... I think I can help you with your injured arm,' Drew replied softly, quite taken aback by the way in which the creature had spoken to him. "'Humans fear us,' even hate us. Why would you want to help me? She asked again, in the soft, gentle, soothing tone. Because I'm trained to help the sick and injured. I do not think of you indifferently when I see that you are hurt. What is your name? My name is Zore. My family are no more. If you are a healer, can you help them? She asked in a hopeful voice, looking at the two aliens who lay motionless on the ground in front of her. Sadly, no, I can't, sorry. If they are dead, I do not have the power to help them any more. But if you are willing to let me attend to your wounded arm, I'll see what I can do to ease your pain. At least, given your anatomical differences to our own body, I can try to help you the best way I know how. Just then, there was the sound of a twig breaking underfoot, and John appeared out of the darkness. The sight of him startled the alien, and she backed further away from them. It's okay. This is my partner, and he is a healer, too, Drew said quickly, trying to regain her trust. Healer? John replied in surprise. What the hell are you talking about? That is the term Zore uses for medical personnel, Drew replied. What? Are you talking to it now? Well, I'll be damned. Has it said why it is on earth? I don't like that healer. He scares me, Zore messaged Drew hurriedly. He could sense the fear in her telepathic message when the tingling feeling at the back of his neck became more intense and ran down his spine. Just leave me to talk to Zore, John. She is not sure of you yet, Drew said calmly to his partner, trying not to exacerbate the situation. She's not sure of me. How do you know that? She hasn't said a friggin' word since I've been standing here, John answered indignantly. She speaks telepathically, John. I can hear her in my head. You sure you haven't hit your head? You're not making any sense to me, John replied, looking at Drew with a cold stare. Just let me handle it, all right? Drew answered gruffly. He was starting to get a bit frustrated with his partner's lack of empathy toward the injured alien. Somehow, when Zare spoke to him, she seemed to have an amazing, calming effect over Drew. It was almost like being in a dream. If it had not been for the fact that John was standing there voicing his opinion so loudly, Drew felt as if he was almost dreaming the whole scene laid out before them. Zare, will you let me help you? he asked again, as he slowly walked towards her until he was standing only a few feet away from the alien. If you can, she replied, as she slowly sat down upon the dusty earth. Drew placed his jump bag on the ground next to his extraterrestrial patient and gently took her good arm in his hands. He was surprised to feel how warm her body temperature was, given that her skin color gave the appearance of a human corpse. Just as he would have checked for fractures on a human, he did so with his alien patient, by running one hand down her good arm and the other down the injured, comparing the differences between the two. He had felt enough closed fractures in his time on the road to know that she definitely had something that was not quite right on the injured side. Drew took a splint and a roller bandage from his bag. I'll need your help, Jono. Can you hold this arm still for me while I secure the splint? Drew asked, peering over at his partner, who was still standing some distance away from their patient. John begrudgingly stepped forward and gingerly held Zure's arm still. 
She looked up at him wearily with her big, dark eyes while Drew set about applying the bandage firmly around her thin gray arm. So what are you doing here on Earth, Zoré? John couldn't help asking the alien himself. He then raised his eyebrows with interest. It seemed as though Zoré had finally trusted him enough to break her silence, because he too could feel a tingling sensation at the back of his head when she spoke. You were collecting food in Colorado? And when you made to leave our planet, your ship was hit by something in the Earth's atmosphere and crash-landed here in the desert? Wow, that is some tale, John replied, looking impressed with the way in which the alien had just spoken to him. What food were you collecting, Zoré? Drew asked with interest, as he tucked the end of the bandage between the splint and her arm. He wanted to join in the silent conversation she was having with his partner. Our species eats grains, corn, wheat, barley. It is our staple diet. We only take a little, though. We would never be so greedy to gather all the crops from the fields you plant. We can't grow the food on our own planet. It does not get enough light. I think you humans refer to the marks we leave behind in your fields as crop circles, Zoré said, looking a little happier now that her fractured arm was supported with the splint. So that explains the reason for those odd patterns in the fields. There has been a great deal of debate about why they appear before harvest time, and now you have confirmed the theory that they are indeed caused by UFOs. Many humans have stated this fact in the past and have been ridiculed because of their observations, Drew said triumphantly, smiling down at her. In the distance, they could hear the faint sounds of sirens getting closer to their location. I'm really sorry, Zoré, but when we saw your ship fall from the sky, we had to let others know of your location so we could get back up. We thought it was a jet plane that had crashed, Drew confessed. He was now worried about what would happen to the alien once the authorities were notified of her existence. I can read your thoughts, Drew. I know what you are thinking will happen to me, but do not fear. There is another ship that will be here very soon to collect me and my parents' bodies. We never travel to Earth alone in case something like this should happen. My kind will be here before your backup, as you call it, arrives. Thank you for your help. I can now tell my species that your kind are not all savages. We tend to stay away from the human race. You all seem merciless, just by the way you kill each other. We do not live like that. We live in peace and harmony with our fellow kind. You are lucky to have such a bright sun and water where food can grow easily. We do not understand why you are such a violent species when you have so much more to be grateful of on your planet than we do on ours. I wonder that myself sometimes, Drew answered with a sigh. Just then, a bright light appeared above them, and as the men looked up, they were staring at the undercarriage of another silver spaceship as it rotated silently above their heads. Goodbye, my human friends, and thank you, Zoré said happily, so that both Drew and John were hit with a warm, calming feeling at the same time, as she telepathically said her farewell. Then their alien friend disappeared in a flash of light, as did the bodies of her parents. All that was left on the ground around them was the remains of the broken spaceship. They heard a swishing sound above their heads, and the UFO disappeared with a bright flash of light into the night sky. It didn't take the responding crews long to find the pair standing next to the crashed wreckage. The responders had thought the bright light in the sky was a search chopper that had located the pair, yet they were not sure why the chopper did not respond to any radio contact. Drew tried very hard to explain what had happened to the sheriff as he stood there with crossed arms and a scowl upon his face. He was very angry with them for approaching the scene without waiting for backup first, but he was even more astonished as he surveyed the wreckage strewn across the ground in front of them. From then on, it didn't take long for the news to spread, and the area was soon surrounded with flashing beacons and choppers flying overhead. Three men, dressed in dark suits, approached Drew and John with long, expressionless faces. Are you both from the EMS unit that was first on the scene here? one of the men asked, with a dry, heartless tone to his voice. Drew nodded. Come with us, he said, pointing to an unmarked black chopper, which had not long landed at the crash site. For what? What's going on? John protested loudly. You need to be decontaminated, he answered coldly. There is a hazmat truck here for that. 
we don't need to go anywhere, Drew replied, now looking rather worried at the solemn expression upon the men's faces. That is not for what we have in mind. As you have been in contact with an alien life form, we are taking you to Area 51 for observation, and under federal law, you have no choice but to come with us, the man replied, with a wry grin on his face. Wake up, Drew, wake up! John was shaking his partner vigorously. You slept through the pager. We have a respond in the desert. The desert? But we had just been there, Drew replied sleepily. Geez, partner, that must have been one hell of a dream. Now hurry up and get dressed. A call has just come in that a jet plane has crash-landed fifty miles from the station. Now hurry up so we can be first on the scene. The End <laughs>